thank you. Uh, thank you to the Venice people for organizing this, and congratulations, Patrick, with the, with the title once more. It's very nice to, to be here with all of you. So um, I was going to uh, give a talk, uh, rather high level, but stress some issues about concerning the difference and uh, <coughs> the issue about uh, security. We've been talking a lot about safety, and I think it's also important. And we, this community has a lot to say about security. So um, the idea is to focus a little bit more in this talk, not only on verification, but also on the certification aspect so where you actually want to convince someone else that all the verification that you've done is uh, proving uh, that the software that I'm trying to convince you to use is correct. So let's start out with uh, just reminding that, uh, so with our safety and our security, um, safety, we generally take that to be uh, absence of runtime errors, undefined behaviors, and maybe even functional correctness. And we have very solid foundations for establishing uh, safety, sort of thing in general, using whole logics, abstract interpretation, which has a firm uh, basis on the semantic description of, of our programming languages. This has been automated in <coughs> particular thanks to this community, uh, and, that, <coughs> and there are also interactive tools where you can involve the developer, the sort of the shall we say, an expert developer to, to prove uh, rather sophisticated properties about your software. When it comes to security, uh, then there's different kinds of properties that the, the security people would say we focus on. So this is, uh, they have their three properties, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, so if we just focus on confidentiality and integrity, then the question is, uh, is some of the information that I consider uh, private or uh, that I want to keep safe, is that protected and not being sent out where? Uh, out to, to the internet? Uh, or dually, uh, is the information on which I take some important decisions in my software, uh, can I trust them as well? And this is uh, quite often formalized as some kind of non-interference property. For this kind of uh, verification, verifying these properties, well, very early on, there was the uh, type-based analysis, the high-low type system by Volpano, Irvin, and, Sh and <coughs> Smith. Um, thanks to, uh, in particular, uh, Roberto and Isabella, there we got not abstract non-interference, which is more detailed. Um, there's also various relational logics, and recently there's been emergence of uh, separation logics that also integrate some kind of, uh, shall we say, these high-low properties and, um, when it comes to tool support, I still think it's fair to say that uh, it's not as uh, evolved as uh, uh, some of the tools uh, that we have for safety, uh, but it's, uh, it's improving. Now, I mentioned certification, and uh, when you talk about certification and people who actually do software certification, then state of the art is uh, that uh, we have something, a process that's oriented on the process, so you have to, to convince someone else that you've followed these very uh, <coughs> number of steps when you've developed your software, you have to show that you have refined from some high-level specification into uh, actually running code. And I think it's generally considered a very resource time-consuming uh, process. What it would be nice uh, to have something that's perhaps more semantics-based, because there's not a lot of semantics in the current certification schemes, based on uh, some kind of semantic certificates that just comes with the program and tells you, okay, this uh, is uh, correct with respect to the specification that we agreed on. It should also be automated, or at least some lightweight procedure involving relatively little. So, well, we have some uh, <coughs> idea of this because maybe some of you remember proof-carrying code that Necula uh, proposed many years ago, actually, um, where the idea generally is that uh, a program should come with a machine verifiable proof of its correctness. Uh, so the idea is uh, you have the a code producer. Let's see if this one can. Uh, oh, this is probably going to. Oh, that's not. There's a code producer and a code consumer. The producer wants to convince the consumer that he can safely install the software uh, on the computer uh, without risking any memory errors. So what they do is that they will uh, agree on some logic for proving absence of memory errors. And then um, the producer will go around sending the code, but also a proof in this logic that 
the program adheres, does not have any uh, memory violations. This can be quite difficult to prove. So the producer, and that's the sort of the art of what Nekula saw, that is that you have to provide some kind of certificate. And in his case, it was some, uh, show how to solve the verif condition, verification conditions uh, that you can then send to the consumer. The consumer can rerun the proof and then check that this works. Actually, the abstract interpretation is excellent for doing uh, proof carrying code because abstract interpretation somehow in there comes with a <coughs> verifier of the proof in the case of a fi post fix point that it has to run through and check that, oh yeah, this was indeed a post fix point. And you can build a whole proof carrying uh, architecture around, well, a certified abstract interpretation where you certify the verifier <coughs> and then just pursue that to the consumer so that the consumer can uh, convince himself that this verifier is semantically correct. And then the producer can use all sorts of uh, tricks to find a post fix point. SMT solvers, machine learning, what I know, guess, just guess the fix point. It still has to be encoded and then for checking at the consumer. So that's the, uh, I think it's an idea. Proof carrying code, unfortunately, has gone a little bit out of, uh, lost a little bit of attention. And I really don't know why, because I think it's an excellent idea that programs should come uh, with a proof of their correctness. In Nekula's original paper, uh, not the one in Popple, but the one before at OSDI, where he first of all, first time introduced proof carrying code, he looked at a particular case uh, called eBPF. And I think it's worth just looking a little, little bit of this. Um, eBPF uh, existed at that time. It's uh, <coughs> the uh, extended packet, Ber Berkeley packet filter, originally it was just BPF. It's a small uh, domain specific language, or at least it was designed for that, for writing uh, network uh, packet filters. So it's very uh, simple. Now there's an E in front of it, which means that people have sort of taken to like this language, and now they start putting more and more features in it. Um, but it's still a relatively benign language. In the beginning, you couldn't even have loops in there. Now I think they want to have some kind of loops. The interesting thing about eBPF is that now there sits inside the Linux kernel an eBPF interpreter so that you could load <coughs> eBPF scripts into your uh, Linux kernel uh, in order to do uh, package filtering and other security relevant stuff. And because this has to be efficient, these scripts actually run in kernel space uh, with uh, permissions to, to do uh, quite a lot of things. That's, of course, a bit safety and security critical. Uh, and there is some uh, load time verification done. So when you come with this script, there, <coughs> there is an eBPF verifier that will establish that memory safety is uh, OK, and also that the code does, not, uh, does actually terminate in all runs. Now here I think there's a little challenge for the community because uh, the verifier, the eBPF verifier, or even the semantics, is actually what is currently implemented in, uh, it's the code in the Linux kernel. There's no formal specification or a definition of this language, and it still plays quite an important role for a security role. So here's a challenge number one for our little community. Well, as I said, there are some security concerns related with eBPF. The, um, First of all, as a filters, they can access confidential data. Nekula's original work already identified this and said maybe we should ensure that these uh, <coughs> filters do not uh, go in and wreak havoc in the memory, so they should be memory safe. But I think there's more to it than that, uh, because as they have information to rather uh, potentially confidential information, there is also a demand that these filters should be proven to, have, uh, to, to be absent of, of memory leakage. And the point is that uh, the thing, we can't just do uh, the usual high-low uh, type systems to verify this because some of these uh, security policies might be quite involved, uh, have data dependencies, like saying, okay, I look at the first part of the packet. Uh, if it's that kind of uh, packet, then it's okay to look at this later part in the packet and so on, which is uh, well beyond at least what you can do with uh, both Palmer Smith type systems. So the question here is that I'll talk a little bit about is that can you construct a logic for information flow that will combine the whole logic that we use uh, to prove some of the memory, basic memory safety properties that already Nicola did, and then <coughs> extend this to some more observational properties, uh, and this will be based on partial equivalations. So I'm pushing a little bit for uh, developing what's called, what I would call a 
uh, Perl logic for information flow. So it's a uniform framework where you can prove both safety and security uh, using the notion of partial equivalence relations. And why partial equivalence relations? Because these Perls have used, in, uh, proved quite useful both to specify safety and security. So the partiality will use that uh, to prove that some identify that some states, bad states, potentially are not, uh, you don't want. And then you can use the equivalence to st state the non-interference or the, the, that some states are indistinguishable as we're used to in, in uh, information flow logic. And then you can do more sophisticated security policies than just the high-low ones, uh, just to make, so that, for instance, well, this one is not so sophisticated. So if we have two variables, uh, x and y, uh, then it's okay to <coughs> know any, x is public, you can observe everything, but the only thing you, know, you are allowed to know about y is whether it's zero or not. And that will just be uh, encoded as a relation on two copies of the state, as we know from information, from non-interference. The question is then, can we build a logic for this? And building a logic means axiomatizing these per properties with an implication relation, and then build logic, program logics where we can reason in the same style, like having whole triples, but now talking in, in purse. So we'll have, uh, first off, uh, all <coughs> a little language of properties, uh, where the, we can integrate the usual state properties, the unary state properties, in, uh, consider them as a uh, partial equivalence relation on <coughs> uh, sets of two states. Purse can also be, you can take the intersection of two partial equivalence relations and still get a uh, partial equivalence, equivalence relation. So intersection is also allowed. And then we have this uh, third uh, construction, the <coughs> kind of existential quantification over two sets of states, where I mean, let's say, uh, basically there exists a variable g that takes the same value in uh, the two worlds that we are considering in, in two runs. To do this, what, well, what we're arriving is that we then have a derived property that can, enables us to state that uh, the value of a given expression e is public knowledge, considered public knowledge. And we have this derived form. It just basically says that there exists some uh, ghost variable which is, uh, that says that uh, this <coughs> expression has the same value in, two, in the two uh, states, uh, which is the way that we formalize this using non-interference. And then you have to uh, build up an implication relation for saying how to reason about these uh, per properties, much as you would uh, do it in, in ordinary uh, first order logic. And, um, then again, we have to make sure that, uh, well, that for instance, how you can, uh, I'm not going to go into any details of this, uh, can talk about this if anybody is interested in that. The interesting thing is that you have a program logic that integrates uh, uh, sort of the whole logic, but also extend this, these rules to now to be talking about per properties. And there you have to, well, you come to the, as we know, a tricky uh, point in uh, information flow analysis is when you have conditionals, uh, that's why you have to be careful because if your condition is uh, depending on secret data, you have to exercise some care. So there are two rules in this logic, there will be two rules where you have, in the first case, to the left, where you can prove that your condition is public information, is publicly visible. In that case, you're fine, you can just go on and reason with the full uh, strength of the logic. And if you cannot, so that even the, the other case, when your condition is potentially secret, well, then it turns out that you will have to restrict your logic somehow and basically go back into and only reason about a subset of the properties that was talking about a particular set of states in the, uh, when you uh, reason about at least the post conditions. So, so let's come uh, to summarize just, uh, I think there are a number of challenges related to this. I still think it's very important that programs come with a proof of its safety and security, at least in certain settings. So I can understand uh, that <clears throat> in, well, I can understand that if you are a developer in meta, in meta you want to have very quick turnaround uh, of your result, uh, of the analysis. Here I think we can allow ourselves a little bit more time and actually produce a certificate for the program uh, that we can ship with the code. And I think it's relevant in many settings. Uh, well, I mentioned this Linux kernel and EPPF, but that's just an example of an implication. Another place where I think this could have uh, interest is uh, in the IoT devices where you would have to ship out some new updates to the code and try to verify that where you need some very compact certificates that can be verified on, on, these, on these devices and where it would be uh, difficult to have this big turnover uh, of code. And then there is the, this little program with the <coughs> do, do, developing a logic for partial equivalence relations, 
where there are a number of things you want to see. Is it possible to axiomatize partial equivalence relations? Maybe there is already an axiomatization, but I'm not aware of this. And uh, there are <coughs> challenges with integrating this with other logics for talking about uh, some more involved uh, states, for instance, with separation logic, and then the whole question about uh, inference and to get this to scale. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Question? <laughs> so, uh, uh, proof carrying code, in a sense, failed. Yes. Because the proof was much larger than the program. That is, it was exponential in the size of the program. Yeah. And uh, there was some work on reducing the size and so on. But ultimately, Seeing, it seems that the, the proof is still exponential, and so gaining a fact or uh, nothing. Do, in your case of your logic, do you have the same? It was a disjunction that was the problem. Do you do you have the same uh, problem, or it doesn't grow exponentially with the size of the program? So, so two two answers to that. Uh, you're absolutely right uh, that the, the proof size. I mean, PCC was said to be. Uh, 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 proof, uh, no, what was it? Program carrying proofs, uh, basically. Yeah, the, but uh, the, um, for the logic, I don't know yet. We still, we're still developing on it. But the point about the abstract interpretation based PCC is that there you could compact the certificates quite a lot because you just had to basically, well, if you just do, say, you want to certify a user polyhedral analysis, you have to provide the loop invariance and the encodings of that. And uh, David and we also did work on using Farkas Lemma to actually construct some very compact certificates that you can verify, which were enough to produce that. So I think abstract interpretation take base techniques, they have something to say about this. Yeah. You know, the only actual place where proof carrying code worked was with the, the Java byte code verifier, where they used that technique. Which, where they get a stack map, they said, okay, at some stage, we just send up a stack map with it, information about how the verifier should go, and then it could just run through the code. So. Yes. I have a naive question about distinguishability. Yes. Um, shouldn't distinguishability be somehow measured not as a, a I mean, true-false property, but a, a property uh, that could say uh, these two, f the, the, I can distinguish whether x is equal to zero uh, uh, with very high probability or very low probability. Ah, okay. Yeah, so you want to quantify it, put a quantification into that as well. Um, I suppose you could do that. As, I mean, then you get into, there's a whole branch of quantitative information flow analysis where they try to uh, give this kind of measure saying how much information you leak, I think, too. Uh, I just want to, let's just get the logic, uh, the per logic out first, but the point taken, point taken. Yes. I have another sure. question. If, that, if you do parallel analyzers, you might stop at something which is not a post-fix point and it, which is correct anyway. And so when you are going to check the code, you have to remember in a sense how you got it. Yeah, yeah, okay. You gave on you, more or less. <laughs> but then you'd have to, I mean, in this PCC scheme, you would have to build it into the, I mean, there's a contract here between the consumer and, and the producer, which is this certified verifier. But the point is that you can verify this against using, here we use proper. If you have a semantic, so this is foundational proof carrying code, you can get a potentially quite complex So all the, the idea is to put as much as work on the producer. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the